Welcome. This is the U2 conference, and I'm speaking today with Wynn Collier, the uh, author of A Burning in My Bones, the new authorized biography of Eugene Peterson. Wynn, thank you for taking some time with us today. Well, I'm really glad to talk with you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, um, this is a project that is near and dear to the hearts of uh, many U2 fans in our audience. Uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, folks who were uh, connected to Peterson before knowing that there was a connection also to Bono um, and we're delighted to see that the two of them got along. Um, and then there are folks like me that got to know who Eugene Peterson was because of you two and because of the message. So uh, I think this will be fun to really dive into. So let's set the scene a little bit and tell me about how you first got connected to Eugene and Jan yourself and then how you decided to do the biography and how they uh, responded to that when you first brought up the idea. Sure. So I, I'm a, a pastor and a writer. Um, I was a pastor for about 25 years um, before we moved here to Holland, Michigan, where I'm working at Western Theological Seminary as the director of the new Eugene Peterson Center for Christian Imagination. And so Early in my pastoral life, I was a confused, befuddled pastor trying to figure out what does it actually mean to be a pastor in our world. And I was uh, filled with zeal, but not very much knowledge. And and so I ended up reaching out to Eugene uh, my first book was being published by one of Eugene's publishers and mm -hmm. I talked to him into giving me his address in Montana and I began to write him letters and he wrote back and he became something of a pastor to me. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we just developed a friendship. And then in 2016, I was in Montana and I, I assumed it was going to be the last time I would see him. Mm -hmm. And as I was going back home to Virginia, I began to think about how someone at some point was going to write the story of his life. And I began to think about what I hoped that story, how it would be embodied and that whoever, whoever told that, that narrative would, would actually understand how, who Eugene was more than just details and numbers and figures, but got his essence and, and then could try to articulate that in the story. And I, wrote him a letter and just told him what I was thinking. And he called me back and we began to talk about it. And I knew he, the last thing in, his, in the world that he was interested in was having a biography written. And I knew that, but I just thought I should at least just tell him what I'm thinking. And after I described it to him again on the phone, I said, Eugene, does this give you energy or does this make you tired? And he just said, when it makes me tired. <laughs> and, uh, um, and he and Jan just really at that moment in a much deeper way invited me into their life. And I spent a lot of time with them at their home in Montana and interviewing scores and going through thousands of letters and probably 60 or 70 journals and mm. manuscripts and spent four years uh, writing this book. Do you, how, 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 much before that, did you know uh, Eugene? When did you first encounter his work? Well, I first encountered his work when it's probably 2000, when a elder member of the church that I was pastoring at the time as a new, newly graduated seminary uh, student uh, handed me after Sunday uh, service mm -hmm. handed me a copy of one of Eugene's books and said, Hey, I think you'll like this. Mm -hmm. I realized later what he meant was, I think you need this. <laughs> and so that was my, that was my journey. I first met him in person. I, I I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm going to mm -hmm. say that may have been 2005, 2006, mm -hmm. something like that. So you got a good number of years under your belt before you had to approach him about his biography. It's I do. Do you, yeah. do you feel like, um, I mean, that, that's a, a tremendous um, gift to be just handed uh, someone's personal journals uh, and the responsibility that that, that yeah. carries. How did that feel to, to kind of pour through those pages? It felt very sacred. It mm -hmm. felt like I was being entrusted with something. I, there was some nervousness about it just from the standpoint of 
here's a man that I admire and I, he's been impactful to me. What will I discover in these journals? <laughs> um, you know, I think we have, at least in the new religious world, um, we have plenty of examples of people uh, that we're learning weren't anything like what we thought they were. Um, their private person was very different from their public person. And, um, and he was, you know, Eugene was far from perfect. He was flawed like all of us. And, um, but I, I was overjoyed to, f to find that he still, he was a man of integrity. Like he, he was the person I thought he was. And so that it ended up being a really beautiful thing of, um, it's just, it's nice in this world, frankly, to find somebody who's true. And so that was really good. There definitely were little bits of, at, at times, feeling voyeuristic. Sure. I was reading things that I'm not sure Eugene ever thought another human would read. Right. I was reading things that his, his kids had not mm. read. Mm. Um, um, so there was, you know, bits of um, just not knowing exactly how to navigate those things. Sure. His life was really quite extraordinary. The number of different vocations that he embodied over the course of his life uh, from being, you know, he was in a kind of a scholarly world for a bit, uh, a pastor mode for most of his life, even if he wasn't like an official pastor, because you said he was spending time with people in this kind of pastoral care way. Uh, he spent time as a professor uh, he spent a long time as a writer alongside uh, most of those other professions. How did he fit it all in? You know, um, one of his favorite images was from a, a Denise Levertov poem of uh, a dog just following the scent, you know, just sniffing things out. I think Eugene would say, I don't have any idea how I fit it in. I was just living my life. Mm. Um, he was very disciplined in his personal, just the way he ordered his life. I mean, mm. he would spend vast amounts of time reading and, and writing and studying. And, um, but he also had, uh, he didn't, he didn't map things, things out at all. He, he just, um, and, and sometimes he would be overwhelmed, particularly as he later in his life, we became a very public figure and was receiving, I mean, thousands of letters and had no staff. I mean, they, I mean he, it was he and Jan in Montana, like there was no yeah. clerk or secretary or administrative help. Um, so there were times where he definitely would get overwhelmed and he would, he would go on what he would call a six month um, sabbatical, um, which for him just meant, taking no appointments, not answering letters, not writing any forwards for books or, I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of requests he got to speak places, to um, endorse books. And most of them didn't even get to him because his agent sort of steered them away. But uh, inevitably people would find his address and, and it was unbelievable the piles that still got to him in Montana. And so, but I think, you know, he, he learned, he did learn to say no pretty well, which is one of the things that I was a big lesson for me, actually. One time I'd asked to come see him and spend a day or two with him, which he did, had done for a number of pastors and writers and artists. And, but um, he, I think I caught him in one of those seasons where he was saying no to everything. And he, and he said no to me. And it, this was probably 2013, 2012, something like that. And it was really sad to me because I thought this is a man I really wanted some more time with him. And I thought that probably meant I would never have that time with him. So it was so bizarre to years later be literally like just staying with he and Jan for extended periods in their home and being invited to his interior world. But all that to say, um, some of how he fitted in because would be he learned to say no to things that didn't feel like they were for him to do whether it uh, gave him energy or made him tired, for instance. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so something that comes through very strongly is this sense of, of literary uh, connection, um, his sense of the scriptures 
clearly he was seeing the, the artistry of the words and he had to keep himself uh, deeply invested in the words of scripture from the original languages because of his work on the message. But uh, can you talk about how that sense of the, the literary connection, especially like things like his reading of, of Brother Skaramatsov, for instance, or his a, a, being able to find the right book on the shelf to recommend to someone who may have needed something to delve into fiction-wise. How, how, how did you see that developing? You know, the, the interesting thing is, I, I'm not even sure I would describe it as, as developing. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure for all of us, these things grow over time. But it, there never was, it wasn't like he had an epiphany and all of a sudden realized, oh, fiction and poetry have, and music have something to offer us as a Christian. Like, there, there never was that dichotomy. He, his, his expansive view of what it meant to live in God's world meant that everything everything was included. Mm. And so, you know, one of his axioms was to say something is spiritual is to say that it can be lived. Mm. And what he meant was spiritual is not something other than the life that we're given. Mm. So it would have been the weirdest thing in the world for him to think that reading Dostoevsky was in any way an, something other than his life with God. And finding the beauty and the truth and the, the sinfulness and the humanity and the questions that we carry with us in those pages. So he even had a season of his life where uh, three times a week he would schedule two hours in the afternoon. In, in his calendar book, he put appointment with Dostoevsky. And, nice. um, and so it was his part of his pastoral work was reading, reading this. In fact, mm. he would regularly tell tell pastors particularly, you're making a mistake if you only read theology. Mm -hmm. You've got to read novels. You've got to read poetry because God is present in those places. And, it, and in some ways he would say, we have to relearn. We need help relearning how to read our scriptures because we have gotten removed from the multifaceted way that God speaks to us in the scriptures. When we need to hear from the poets and the novelists and the musicians um, to help us actually hear the scripture. That feels like it's a very strong connection to how I understand uh, Bono's story as well. Um, this sense of like <laughs> looking for baby Jesus under the trash, just like being present in the created world as a, in, in the spiritual world as well. So I'm, I'm seeing though that there's, definitely in like what I'd call religious culture writ large, at least in our, our Western world, there's more of a tendency towards polemics, more of a tendency towards kind of black and white characterization. So did you see him having to navigate that and how to find some footing within that and stay grounded to the artistry? Or did he have that sense of inbound creativity that just kept him there despite the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Yeah. <laughs> um, it probably was something of both. I, I mean, there was something contrarian to him, mm -hmm. but he grew up in, you know, he grew up in, in Montana, which was big country. And it shaped him as someone who always saw God's world as vast, mysterious, uh, as real as the rock underneath his feet and the mm -hmm. pine pine tree next to him and the massive flathead lake in front of him that he would dive into and be submerged and be that was being submerged in the grace of God. Um, he, he gobbled up stories and literature from the time he was a little, little boy. Um, so the stories of scripture and the stories of Copperfield, you know, were not distinct. Like, I mean, they were distinct and they, they reached their own thing, but they weren't like in two separate worlds. They were in the same world, which was God's world. And that was the, th the thing for him is that God's world is the most expansive, wide reality. And so when he encounters, you know, a religious world, which frankly he grew up in, I mean, he grew up in a, in a sectarian version of Pentecostalism. Um, it, it never made sense to him 
intuitively. It never, it never rang true. And so I think he was always kind of going his own way. And if I could sort of put it this way, I think it's because he had actually read his Bible a whole lot. Um, yes. And because he read his Bible and was paying attention to what the Bible is and what the Bible's saying and what God is doing, what Jesus is doing in the Bible, it never made sense to him to separate these things or to get some kind of um, – to turn Scripture into a, uh, a weapon to be used for human power, to try to lord it over someone else, to try to create cultural power. Those things – you know, that was Babylon – that was that was what the the scriptures were speaking against and to, and to do that in the name of christianity um uh, that's blasphemy yeah. and and so um i think there was just something a grace that he received and kept paying attention to that mostly made those things not make sense to him mm. Mm. i i can't help but knowing what I know again about about Bono and the, the the work that you too has done to call out some of the um, uh, hypocrisy sometimes found in, in religion that that there must be some kind of way that they they may have had the same vibe uh, and, and a recognition there though though in your book there is a funny timeline to how he and Bono first encountered each other and. Peterson is like, oh, I don't know about the celebrity culture thing. Like, so, but, but it also seems to happen fairly, fairly quickly. Like he didn't even seem to know who you two were back in 2001 when Bono first started name dropping Peterson and, you know, quoting from the message in the, their concerts. Uh, but I, I have a book where um, Peterson gave the forward to a, 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 a book of sermons that were inspired by you two. And he talks about, uh, you two as a prophetic voice and compares them to John the Baptist. Uh, and this came out in like 2003. So I feel like people might have been like coaching him on like they, they were they were immersing him in in you two as other people immersed <laughs> as he immersed other people in the scriptures. Do you do you have a sense of of how his understanding of you two developed? Did that come through in 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 the uh, journals or in a conversation at all? Well, I mean, first of all, I think he, um, his grandkids told him, <laughs> told him who, who Bono was after he, they realized that, that he had, um, declined the, the first chance to go meet with Bono. And, and then he did definitely had some students at Regent who would, who pulled him aside, said, you got to come and listen to, and, and he went to, uh, one of their apartments and one of the students and she began to play some of you two's. Um, albums for him and mm. I think he he I mean he was uh again super literate and mm. and he he could he could pick up on the, the he appreciated artistry mm. and he could pick up on when somebody is writing something that is piercing and true and coming from a true place as opposed as opposed to um purely being commercial mm. and I think he rec he could recognize that, but honestly, as much as recognizing it in you two at first, I think he recognized it in the people that he loved who were around him who recognized it. Right. And he was always, I mean, to him, everything about Christian faith is relational. Right. And so when he was encountering another person that he loved, he could see through their eyes the impact on them and how it was opening up space in their story and how it was giving them a language for their questions or their longings or their anger or their hope. And he was, he was a good human, a good pastor. He could see that that was true and he would never, um, even if it wasn't his thing, um, he would never uh, demean something that true and beautiful that someone else is receiving. Hmm. Hmm. It also made me think, reading through the, the, the section um, where you describe their relationship, uh, that it very much felt like the kinds of pastoral relationships you were describing that he was having with other people as well. Especially, you know, there's this great line that you talk about how 
voluminous the journals are, really, but every time that it was, you know, an encounter, it's lunch with Bono. It's not really uh, talked about in detail. And that, and that Bono himself said that what he wanted to do was confess his sins to Eugene and Jan when they, when they got together. So uh, I, I feel like there might be some, some it, it was definitely a two-way street that there was some mentoring that they both sensed could, could be happening. Yeah, I think, I think they, they grew to admire and respect one another. And um, I do think e Eugene felt that it was a pastoral relationship there was a story, I think it's in the book, where one of Eugene's former students at Regent was a massive U2 fan and happened to be at his house in Montana. So this would be after Regent days. Happened to be at his house when Eugene was packing up a box for Bono. And this guy said, can I slip a note in? Can I just slip a, th a, th a little <laughs> note? That just a little note. <laughs> yeah. And Eugene just looked at him, I mean, kindly, but said no. This is a this is a pastoral relationship, right? Um, and even in my um, in my in my research, I mean, Eugene opened up his entire life to me and um, shared intimate parts of every everything of his life, um, and gave me names and contact information for all these people to to contact. Um, but beside Bono, he put a question mark, <laughs> um, and. Uh, you know, I just, I think there was something about, be, because of our obsession with celebrity, yes. there's something that he felt is anti-Christian anti about the way we engage celebrity, the, the pressures we put on people, what we expect from them, how we use them, mm -hmm. the dangers of being a celebrity, frankly, um, and I just think um, he was super sensitive, which I admire, to in any way using that relationship. Yeah. Um, and I find that, like, that makes me love Eugene all the more because that's the kind of person I respect and admire and I want to be like. Um, and so, yeah, he was never – I don't – I wouldn't call him, like – some people – you know, could have had a relationship, a relationship like that with someone of of notoriety, and and been coy about it in a way that almost, I don't know if you, if, if this makes sense, but almost increases the allure because they're being sure. coy about sure. it. Right. But it wasn't it wasn't that. It was right. just it was just a, a real matter of fact. Like no, that's not that's not what this is about. Um, and um, I, I find that beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, the the sense comes through in in your book how uh, Eugene's own celebrity grew over time. So I'm sure <laughs> there was a certain amount of like, yeah, we recognize some of this, these these pressures in each other and can can kind of troubleshoot uh, that experience uh, with each other a little bit. Um, Although Bono, obviously, in a whole different galaxy. <laughs> true that. True that. Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions that came through when I asked other people like, uh, it, having this opportunity, uh, uh, my friend, uh, Tracy on Twitter was interested particularly in the, the journals again, like knowing that when you're crafting a book, you know, there is an art to telling the stories to have them cohesive though lives are sprawling. Uh, were there, were there stories that you really wish you could have shoehorned in and didn't quite, didn't quite make the cut. Yeah, there were some, I and mean, we cut a hundred and I think roughly 130,000 words. Oh, so the director's cut of... will come out next year, right? <laughs> oh, probably not. But yeah. Um, I mean, there definitely were, um, there definitely were places and, and different stories. Um, there was, um, it, it did at times feel overwhelming because, mm -hmm. you know, well-told story needs to have movement in it and um, not plod too much. At the same time, part of the beauty of Eugene's life was it's so ordinary. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, 
obviously looking over the whole course of his life and even that we're sitting here talking about you two and Bono in the same, I mean, and, and Eugene in the same uh, in interview um, says that it doesn't feel super ordinary, but he was, I mean, at, the, at his core, he was just a very ordinary person, ordinary pastor, ordinary writer, ordinary dad, ordinary husband. And um, so there was definitely moments of how do I really show how ordinary he was and at the same time not make readers like eyes glaze over you know um so i i think we arrived at that but but to do that did mean cutting a lot of things yeah and uh, another question that came through from uh christopher was asking about um the discipline that it took uh did he have like a did it and it did it stay uh similar throughout his life of how much writing and reading he would do or running uh, running was more during college and then 15 to 20 years during his pastoral, he returned to that when he, he needed a physical way to get his energy out and to, to center his mind and heart. But as far as the reading and writing part, absolutely. I mean, he was a very disciplined person in the, just in the sense of the way he ordered his life. I mean, he would be up early every morning. He would be reading and in, and contemplation in, in the scriptures and, and then reading other things for an hour or two. He would often, uh, uh, in the later years, he would add on making coffee f in the French press for Jan and taking it to her in, in her bedroom. Um, and then, you know, um, had, had, had an organized structure somewhat for where he would put letters and then try to block off times, times of the week to, to return letters and mm. um so yeah his his life was was very similar um i mean obviously in seasons where he was traveling more speaking more the things would get interrupted but sure yeah he, he had a he had a a flow to his life that felt felt consistent when uh i could talk to you about eugene peterson all day and i Thoroughly uh, recommend folks pick up your book because, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave with this, with, that just for the story of uh, the psychedelic mushrooms and the communion bread alone. Um, so someone will have to actually read the book in order to hear what I'm talking about there. But Wynn, thank you again for taking the time today and uh, have a great rest of your day. Well, I appreciate you inviting me. It's been a good conversation. Thank you.